Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome again to Across Culture, uh, where we've been looking at what really is true love. Uh, on the back of your new sheet, there's an outline of what I'm about to say, and uh, also on page three, uh, well, there used to be. Oh, sorry, the Q&A number is uh, underneath the sermon. It's changed its place. Uh, so if you have a question as we're going through, please feel free to uh, text it uh, to that number. Uh, just by way of recapping our introduction, uh, you'll remember that the Ten Commandments were given uh, by God to the people of Israel after he had rescued them uh, from slavery in Egypt. Uh, so it begins with these words, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery, out of Egypt. So they're given in the context of people who have been rescued. And uh, that's their relevance to us today. We are people, if you're a Christian, you're somebody who's been rescued uh, by something a lot worse than slavery uh, in Egypt You've been rescued from slavery to sin and from the penalty of sin and you've been brought into a relationship with God. So the reason we've, we've uh, entitled this series True Love is because Jesus summed up the whole law uh, in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. So this really is about our response of love to God's love towards us. So uh, from now on, from last week on, actually we're in the, in the bit of the Ten Commandments where it's, rela- it's all about how we love our neighbour. So our response to God's love for us is to love him, but also to love those around us. And so these commands were describing how we do that, how we put that into action. The next four commandments are just 11 words in the original. And the one today... Uh, is looking at how God values life, just two words uh, in Exodus 20, 13. Murder and don't. <laughs> don't murder. It's very, whoops, very straightforward, very clear. So three points on your outline, murderous actions, murderous attitudes and murdered saviour. So firstly, murderous actions. Uh, this commandment, of course, addresses an issue that's plagued humanity since the beginning the very first person born on this planet murdered his brother he got jealous God warned him he said Cain sin is crouching at the door and it seeks to rule over you but you must rule over it Cain chose not to take any notice he killed his brother God banished him and made him a fugitive throughout the earth Cain, of course, feared for his life because he'd taken life. And uh, that's the just penalty for it, actually. But God, in his grace and mercy, uh, put a mark on Cain so that people would not kill him. So again, we see right there at the beginning how much God values life. Uh, We fast forward seven generations Genesis 4, the same chapter, it's only a few verses after. And there's a bloke there called Lamech. And he's boasting to his wives uh, that he's, uh, you know, if, if Cain uh, was avenged seven times, I'm avenged 77 times. He's a killer and he's proud of it. He's boasting about it. It's not long after that that God decided to set the reset button on humanity and the flood came and he started again with Noah and his family. And then we fast forward to Moses who is actually there as God's delivering these commandments. And Moses himself is a murderer. (laughs) Moses grew up, of course, in Egypt. Keep hitting that. And uh, his birth actually was surrounded by murder, wasn't it? Pharaoh was trying to control the population of the Hebrews. They were becoming big and strong. And uh, he, he, he issued an order that all the male kids would have been put to death as they were born. Moses escaped that by the grace of God. And as Moses grew up, he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew. And he looked around. He thought no one was looking. And he killed the guy and buried him. Now, the fact that he had to look around, he knew he was doing the wrong thing. And he had to flee. 
Now you can imagine Moses as God's delivering these commandments and he gets to number six, you shall not murder. Moses must have took a very big gulp at that point. And yet here he is, God has made him the leader of God's people at that time. So this is a big issue. It's a big issue because murder is a defiance of God, the giver of life. To take the life that God has given is a very big thing. So this command is very necessary. But what actually are we talking about here? Some versions, the older version, some of them have you shall not kill. The ESV has you shall not murder. And then it has a footnote uh, that goes like this. The Hebrew word also covers causing human death through carelessness or negligence. God highly values life. It's his right alone uh, to give and to take away. And we can tell from the kinds of deaths uh, in the law that attract the death penalty what the scope of this word is. Uh, Exodus 21, 12, it's intentional killing. The law distinguishes between intentional and unintentional and that's reflected in our legislation actually, isn't it? Because we have murder and we have manslaughter. Manslaughter is where they can't prove that there was an intention to kill somebody and there's a lesser penalty even in our law. Uh, So intentional killing. Another one is not confining a known dangerous animal that causes somebody else to die. If you've got a lion in your backyard that you know is going to kill somebody, uh, then if you don't chain it up and that lion goes and kills somebody, then you be put to death under the Old Testament law. Uh, it's also applied to making human sacrifice. This is one of the reasons for the holy war that's about to unfold, that God is sending his people into the land of Canaan. One of the reasons God's bringing judgment on those people is because they, amongst lots of other things, they practice child sacrifice. And God says, if you do that, you sacrifice your child, you will be put to death. It also extends to duty of care type things. So in Deuteronomy 22 verse 8, it says, When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house, if anyone should fall from it. So if you build a house without a good fence around the top and someone fell off it, then you're responsible uh, for their death. And this is, by the way, this is why uh, as a leadership last, meeting, last week at our elders meeting, we're talking about these kinds of things. Our duty of care to make sure that people don't get injured uh, here at Cross Culture or kids don't get abused and stuff like that. It, we, we have a duty of care before God uh, to do that. Now, this command makes sense, I think, to most people. Most cultures uh, have this somewhere in their, rationa- in their laws. What's the rationale for it, though, in the Bible? Uh, firstly, it's about who God is. So God is the giver of life. And therefore, he has the only, he's the only one who has the right to decide under what circumstances life might end. It is not a right that he has given to individuals like you and me to go around deciding who can and can't live. And so in this same book, uh, he clearly defines the circumstance in, as an, and offences that call for the death penalty. Uh, Willful murder is one of them, just as we've just uh, looked at. But it's God who decides uh, who and who is and isn't punishable by death. So it's tied up with the character of God. Secondly, it's tied up with who we are. Uh, we are made in God's image. This is an idea that's repeated uh, throughout the Bible about how we treat one another. Genesis 9, 6, again very early on in the Bible. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So every human being is made in the image of God. From conception through to death. Each human being is to be valued and cared for as unique bearers of God's image. Psalm 139 that was read to us, by the way, uh, shows that God knows us intimately uh, from the, our mother's womb right through to death. He knows us. He has a relationship uh, with every person in that sense as creator and carer. 
Science, of course, tells us too that at conception, a new life is formed uh, with his or her, or her own unique genotype that's separate, different uh, from the parents. Uh, so in our society today, I think there are two big times when we are tempted uh, to devalue life. One is the one I've already touched on in that period of time between conception and birth. I was a young uni student uh, when the pressure to legalise abortion uh, was running hot. And I me- remembering back to those times, the whole debate was run on a couple of issues. One was, uh, we ought to be allowed to do this if the life of the mother is in danger. And we ought to be able to do this if the life of the child is in danger, if the baby is in danger. And the third one was we ought to be able to do this uh, if, if somebody has been raped and uh, become pregnant as a result of that. That was what was pushed at the time. And now, decades later, what's happening? 98% of abortions today are done for social reasons. People just, it's inconvenient to have a kid at that time. Well, I didn't mean to get pregnant or whatever, or the, or the, or the father bullies the, the, the woman into having an abortion. It's very hard to get figures on abortion in Australia uh, because they're not, the statistics are not recorded. But the estimates, best estimates, are between 80 and 90,000 babies are aborted in Australia every year. Worldwide, it's 40 million. Way more than all the people who are killed in wars. 40 million lives lost every year. That's more than one every second. Uh, Friends, this is really, really difficult, isn't it? This this is flying in the face of what God says here. Uh, Now, I know there are sometimes reasons where that it is a choice between the mother's life and the baby's life and they're very difficult decisions to make. And uh, I don't want to say that, you know, if, if anybody ever does this, then they're in hell forever. But I think it's just something that we ought to do with very, very great caution given what God has said here. I'm also aware that this is a very painful subject for some of you sitting here this morning. You may have been bullied into having an abortion. You, uh, you, you, you may... I've had one willingly and deeply regret it. Uh, you may be in that category of person who would desperately love to have a baby and can't. And every time you hear that someone has aborted somebody, some, uh, a, a, a baby, it causes you deep grief and pain and anger and agony. Friends, if any of those scenarios are you this morning, the, the, the good news is actually that our God is gracious and compassionate. He is in the business of healing the brokenhearted and the wounded. And if we come to him and say, Lord, I need your help, please, please help me. Please forgive me if I need forgiving. Please, please fix my broken hearts. Help me to live your way. So that's the beginning of life. At the other end of life, there's a push uh, in our own state to legalise what they call mercy killing, euthanasia, uh, physician-assisted suicide. It is coming into our state parliament this year. There's a big push on uh, to legalise this. There's many, many issues surrounding this. I thought it would be good this morning to uh, get an expert in our congregation, Dr Chong, uh, and just chat to him for a while about these things. Uh, Chong has been a specialist geriatrician for 30 years uh, with St Vincent's Health. Um, so, Chong, you've been caring for aged people, people at the end of their life now, for, for 30 years. What keeps you going? Because I take it most of your patients die. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to answer that question, uh, by God's grace, I have been serving in the area of aged care, uh, in which there's a lot you can do. Um, for the aging population in Australia. It does involve teamwork. Uh, I've enjoyed working in hospital wards, outpatients, and community assessments. Uh, I also, you know, working in aged care has allowed me to have a f- fairly balanced lifestyle uh, between work, family, serving in the church, and also recreation. So what parts of the Bible have helped you as you 
do this ministry, and I guess as you grapple with some of these ethical issues. Yeah. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, when God made a covenant with Abraham, it carries the principle that we are blessed to be a blessing. And uh, God has blessed us with skills in different areas and also resources in order that we can bless others uh, as well. Also, the Bible teaches us that men and women are made in God's image and they're valued members of society. Uh, as far as in the all both the New and Old Testament, there have been commandments specifically towards the elderly, uh, like honoring your parents. Now, your parents may be young now, but they will get old. Okay, and uh, and also to pro to care for those widows uh, who are in need. As I say, you young people out there, uh, you, sorry, you uh, people like me, older people, be nice to your kids because they're going to choose where you go at the, towards the end of your life to maybe choose the nursing home for you. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, we often hear that people in the last stages of life ask uh, to end it all. Now, in your experience as a geriatrician, uh, how often does that occur? Uh, not, not very common at all. I think if you care for their physical needs, their psychosocial needs, and also their spiritual needs, and enable them to live a fairly good quality of life, this question never come up, uh, including those people you know, who are terminally ill, including those who have cancer. In my experience, rarely, no. Rarely. So have you personally ever been asked to... To do that? No. Uh, I think because people know that if they know that you care for them and their services, they can meet their needs. These questions don't come out. In fact, a lot of them value life and uh, they value the family. So the doctor's organisations are opposed to euthanasia or a physician-assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. The AMA has come out strongly against it even last year. Uh, you can see that statement up on the screen. Now, why is that? Uh, traditional medical ethics have never sanctioned euthanasia, even on request on pa compassionate uh, motives. The Hippocratic Oath, which every doctor swear when they got registered, it states, I will give no deadly medicines when asked, nor su suggest such counsel. Uh, in the statement in 1992, in the statement in Mabella, um, the World Medical Association confirmed that assisted suicide, like euthanasia, is unethical and must be condemned by the medical profession. So when a doctor intentionally and deliberately enable a person to end his or her life, the doctor acts unethically. Okay. Um this final question, how can we care better for people who are uh, at the end of their life or getting getting that way? Um, I think uh, as in the church or in, in, uh, or in your family, care for them years before they, they are near the end of their life. That's where you should start. I can give two examples from this church. One is Uncle Jim Collette who lived to... 103. Uh, he is the founder of the Melbourne City uh, Mission. The other one is Mrs. Ruth Morton, uh, who lived to the age of 76. Years before uh, now they went to be with the Lord, they were involved in life group, uh, and uh, they were uh, you know, reaching out and, and discipling uh, young people in this church. And there is a small group of people uh, who visit them and care for them practically when they're near the end of their lives when they're in aged care facilities. And uh, yeah, there are, there are quite a few people in aged care facilities who have very few visitors. And, uh, and, and don't forget, uh, they've got, uh, even if they have their own family, there's a bigger family. And we are their extended family as well. Thank you very much, Chong. If you want to, um, if you want to, uh, <laughs> So just, uh, yeah, do care for me and allow me to care for you <laughs> while I'm able. <laughs> Which uh, aged care home are you in? I want to book in. <laughs> okay. So I think the message from this part of the, the, the this command here is uh, the application I want to make now is we need to regard every person uh, as valuable in God's sight. 
no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how poor, no matter how weak, what their ethnicity, their, their, their uh, sexuality, whatever. We need to regard people as valuable uh, in God's sight. Secondly, I think let's support people who are tempted to take another life, whether it be their own life or uh, a person at the start of life or, or near the end of life. Um, John Stott says this in his great book, uh, Fa- uh, Issues Facing Christians Today. He's got a great chapter on these issues. He said, It is love which gives quality to life and makes it worth living. And it is we, their neighbours, who can choose whether to give love or withhold it. The quality of life is in our hands. So, friends, if you know somebody who's... Uh, become pregnant and is struggling with that, having what they call an unwanted pregnancy. The the issue is not to condemn them, but to support them and encourage them and help them uh, to value the life of the little one in them. If you know somebody who's at the end of their life and is getting sick and tired of living, uh, extend love to them and give them a reason (laughs) to keep going, their relationship with you and ultimately their relationship with God. Remind them of the love of Christ for them. Uh, This Thursday is Are You OK Day? And uh, I've written about that in the bulletin. You can read how that came about. But this is just a day that's that's, uh, been been started to encourage us to just look around at the people around us, our colleagues at work, our family members, friends, and just say, you're OK, mate, you're all right. Especially if we notice that they're being a bit, they're a bit down or something like that. And friends, if they say, no, I'm feeling really awful, then follow up on it, listen to them and, and, and say to them, do you feel safe? Uh, because people get suicidal and, and it's good to ask them, they don't be nosy about it, but say, are you feeling safe? And if they say, actually, well, no, I'm not. Say to them, how can I help you to feel safe? Uh, sometimes we've had to hide things in our home as we've had people with us who are suffering from really deep depression and it's at their say-so. And Sometimes they've said, hang on to these medications when I need them, I'll ask you for them uh, or whatever. Friends, that's practical. Do stuff like that that helps them to value their life. Okay, you might be sitting there thinking, well, at least this command is one I haven't broken. I've never murdered anyone. Or maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, no. (laughs) Um, But anyway, if you're sitting there thinking, I haven't broken this one, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, to our murderous attitudes. Before we look at Matthew 5, even in the Old Testament, uh, God makes a link there between our attitudes, the stuff that's in our heart, and murder. Uh, Leviticus 19, 17 and 18 says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbour, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. Now Jesus expands this in, uh, in Matthew 5. He says, Everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, You fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you have ever been angry with your brother, if you have ever insulted somebody, if you ever called somebody a fool, or if you ever said to somebody, oh, you're a waste of space, that's more common these days, isn't it, to say stuff like that. And Jesus says you've got blood on your hands. You have broken the sixth commandment. You have committed murder. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that I've come across people in my life who are totally obnoxious and you think, it would be so good if they weren't here. (laughs) I murdered them in my head, really. I've imagined a world in which they don't exist. And Jesus says, if that's you, you're a murderer. I think it is so easy, isn't it, when we start to see someone in a bad light that we just stack up all their bad points and eliminate their good points <laughs> and forget the idea that they are made in God's image and in fact they are in deep need of the grace and the mercy of God just as we are. 
and we need to recalibrate. The application that Jesus gives here uh, and the Old Testament writers and New Testament writers, they all say the same thing. Deal with your anger. How do you deal with it? If your brother or sister has something against you, go to them. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't take communion until you've sorted it out with them. I think that means in our context. That's how Paul applies it. If you drink and eat without recognising the body, the body of Christ, as in the people in the body of Christ, then you're eating and drinking destruction on yourself. It's very serious. And Jesus goes on to say that if you don't do that, your accuser will put you in jail and you will stay there until you've paid in full. This is very, very serious. So I want to say to you, and I say to myself this morning, if there's someone that I'm avoiding, there's someone that I'm playing no speaks with, Jesus says, go and talk to them. Go to them. If you're offering a gift at the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Go to them. Don't wait for them to come to you. We often make that an excuse, don't we? Well, they're the one who sinned against me. They need to come to me. No. Jesus says if they have something against you, you go to them, right? We take the initiative. If you think you're in the right, and mostly we do, don't we? Um, (laughs) Go to them. Sort it out. How do you do that? Well, why don't you try something like this? Go to them and say, look, it doesn't feel like things are right between us. Can we talk about it? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's sit down and talk about this and resolve it. How can we put things right? The Apostle Paul says, as far as it lies within you, be at peace with all people. So according to Jesus, we're all guilty before God. If you've ever thought badly about someone, if you've insulted somebody, if you've ever been angry with somebody, ever called anybody a fool or a waste of space, Jesus says, we're guilty. What can we do? Well, the purpose of the law, of course, is to lead us to Christ. Galatians 3.24, Paul says, the law is our guardian to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith, not by our works, not by sorting out our murderous stuff that we've done in the past or the thoughts that we've had coming to Christ and letting him work in us to change us. And that's our third point, the murdered saviour. Jesus is the image of the invisible God par excellence. God himself come in the flesh. And Jesus perfectly fulfilled all the law and this law as well as he said he would. That's the way he's come. He's not come to do away with it but to fulfill it. Jesus never killed anybody. Uh, he, he never called anyone an idiot. Uh, he, he, never, he, he didn't get angry with people. He didn't insult people. He did call people out, didn't he, about hypocrisy and stuff like that, but he went to the issue. He didn't attack the person. And so Jesus came to pay the price for our brokenness, our broken relationships, our murderous hearts and minds. Jesus came to die in our place because, friends, the penalty for murderous actions and attitudes is death. That's what the Bible tells us. Either we pay or someone else pays. And Jesus makes it really clear that if, you're, if you've had this kind of attitude against somebody um, in, in uh, verses 25 and 26, he says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. How do you get out of jail? If you're stuck in there and you need to pay the last penalty, penny, and the penalty is death in this case, you can't do it. Somebody outside the jail has to do it. And only Jesus can pay that price. Only Jesus has paid that price. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, He didn't revile in return when he suffered. He didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree 
that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. What wonderful words those are. Healed from our brokenness, our anger, our hatred and all of those things. Jesus paid the price. Friends, if you're not yet a Christian, if you are not yet trusted this Saviour, please do it today. It is your only hope, it is my only hope, it is our only hope. Because we're before God, we are all guilty. Trust him, trust his sacrifice uh, for us. And value life. If you're a person who has trusted Jesus, please value every life, every human life. Uh, Jim Packer, who's wrote a book on the Ten Commandments, said this, Human life is thus the most precious and sacred thing in the world, and to end it or direct its ending is God's prerogative alone. We honour God by respecting his image in each other, which means consistently preserving life and furthering each other's welfare in every, in, in all possible ways. I'm going to leave space for us to respond to God in prayer, uh, individually and privately, and then I'll lead us in prayer, uh, and then we'll have questions. So friends, let's bow before our great God, uh, confess our need of him and his forgiveness, and entrust ourselves to him.